Xana stuff is very related to what was talked about in the session prior. Just a different way of looking at it. So, what is um, machine learning? Well, here's one definition. So, first we have computer science, and computer science is the study of programs and algorithms. And in a way, you might want to make statements about certain algorithms before you actually run them, or before you write them. You might want to understand their properties, like the worst case, the worst case, how long is it going to take? Um, and so how much memory is this thing going to use? How much time is it going to take? Right? So that's computer science. It's the study of programs and algorithms operating on a computer. Right? I'm told it's going to be very advanced, so this is too, uh, too, too advanced, right? Obviously it isn't. Statistics, that was like the, the session we just had. And really, this is inference from data. Right? And this is like we're trying to reduce our uncertainty about the world. We're trying to make statements about the world. Um, by making observations about the world. Machine learning, it's in the intersection of these two things, right? That's one way to look at it. So really what we're doing is we're trying to use data and observations about the world to write computer programs. So we're gonna use ideas from statistics, right, and data, and the, but the output is not gonna be knowledge or learning about the world, question? Yeah. Let's stretch. The output is going to be an object. It's going to be a little program that's going to do something. It's going to execute on a task. Is that clear? Does that seem reasonable? So it's none of this. It's, this is machine learning in here. None of this is regression or deep learning or whatever. I hate that way of. I, I hate like the degree way of defining something like big data and its velocity. It doesn't mean anything. There's no concise way of thinking about it. Here, it's just this intersection: input, observations. Output a program, right? And this is actually a program that someone wrote, a little machine learning program, to solve Waldo. So they ruined it. So it solves all all Waldo. I know there's this bunk robot. Look at this. This is weak. Look at that. So then there's this little robot they add. Look at that. That's probably fake anyway. That's bunk. But anyway, so Waldo has been solved. AI actually has. Anyway, so what are the types of machine learning? There's different types of problems. The one that usually people think about or talk about is supervised learning. And many of you probably, who here is familiar with machine learning supervised learning? Oh, you're here to heckle. Okay, so the hassle merchants wait till the end and you can, you, can, you can badger me at the end. Or if you think I'm saying something that's not clear to the other folks, uh, you can chime in. I praised you already. Right. Oh, yeah. I can leave yeah. them. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is good. This is good. We're gonna, I'm going to use some of stuff. Yeah. Um, so th this is the this is the task. Okay. This is the task. And since all of us know, many of us know JavaScript. Just just think a little script. Anyway, what do we want to do? We have we have inputs. We have data. We have a thing. And then we're trying to learn a mapping. The output. This is the thing we're trying to predict. So think of a map or a function, we're trying to learn a function, or a program that maps inputs to outputs. That is supervised learning, okay? So, for example, let's say this is our data. We have our input data, and then we have the output data, and we have these pairs, right? So, the output is the thing we're trying to predict, we're trying to learn. If we know this, can we predict that, right? And so in our minds, one of the examples you had, maybe this is, um, um, I don't know, the contrast code of some button color. Someone was talking about contrast. That was a good thing to test or not. And then maybe this is order value, right? And you think maybe there's some relationship between the two. Or in the language earlier, this is your independent variable. So everyone who was in the previous session should understand that dependent variable. This is going to be dependent upon this. Okay? And actually in statistics, this is up to you in a way. This is really this really forms the joint distribution. There's a joint between these two. And it's in a way that statistical relations this is why it's correlational as opposed to causal. And maybe next next time we can talk about causal modeling. But here this is just statistical modeling. And you have to impose this assumption that there's that relationship. Because it could go the other way. Okay, so this is what we want to learn, this mapping. Well, I want, here I have this big table. Here I have a big lookup. But I want to learn a rule. I want to learn a function, a relationship. And in this case, you guys could have probably already just done that mentally. 
I just multiplied it by two. So the, the hidden function, the hidden thing, but, but we don't remember. I don't. This is the relationship because I created it. But nowhere does this say two is the relationship between input and output. <coughs> but you have the data. So the data, the data is what is observed, and what is sort of hidden. What we are trying to learn from the data is just this, this little equation. I know this seems really trivial and bunk, but this is this is really it. That's su that's basically supervised learning. We're done. Yep. So <laughs> now the rest, of, uh, yeah, the rest is commentary. But now go study. Okay. So how would we use it? Well, we want to use this to take an action. So this is the model I had before. Output is equal to two input, and you might do something like this. So here you here's my here I have a little program that I've used my modeling, and now this is the machine learning because this this map this thing has been learned by analyzing the data. Okay, so like in this case, maybe if if our function is greater than ten, I want to show the user product A. Else, pick product B. Obviously, it can be much more complicated. But like this is in your mind, think little programs or big programs. It depends. But something that's going to execute on a task, right? You're going to give it input. It's going to give you an output. So, actually, how are you going to do it? How, how are we going to learn this thing? And so, there's a whole set. There's like a zillion different types of methods. Um, there's like a lot of like excitement around deep learning right here. Um, that has there's costs and benefits, and there's there's marginal trade-offs to, to complexity. So, let's just talk about linear regression. Who here knows about linear regression? So, oh, like everyone does. Okay, this is gonna be totally boring. Okay, so <laughs> how do you learn this? Well, how well do you know it? Okay, so maybe it'll be a quick Okay, so this is, we wanna learn this. This is a linear model, right? And so this is the input here. And what we're trying to learn is these guys. We don't know these, these two guys. We don't know the relationship, right? And we want, it's a function, but we're basically saying y is a function of x and x can be multidimensional. What? No? Well, the error term. The what? The error. Well, the, 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 don't worry. Oh, yeah, and then, and... I'm a statistician, so it's... <laughs> yeah, and so there's some... I really yeah, learning. No, 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 let's, let's be, come on, let's be exact. <laughs> so this is the structure, and then there's some error structure over here. No, there is an error structure over no, here? No, no, I'm just, just... No, that's fine. Yeah, so, so what he's saying is the relationship between y and x, there's going to be some, some explainable part of it. And then there's most likely, since it's some sort of stochastic process, there's going to be some unexplainable part. Very important, actually. Because I would argue for most marketing problems, and this is why probably deep learning or more complex models, not appropriate. I'll say it right now. And we can argue about this afterwards. I'm totally happy to argue about anything, um, especially this thing, because I'm right, um, is that if this is big, the error structure is big, the irreducible error or the Bayes risk or whatever, however you want to call this part of it, then um, you, you, you probably don't want a very complex model because it's, it's probably going to start modeling this. What you don't want to do is just model the data. You want to learn that relationship, right? And not just this instance of the data. This, this instance of the data is just a sample. Of a, of a larger population. Okay, so output, input, and this is what we want to learn. We want to learn the relationship. That's the that's the supervised learning part. This is too slow. I can't tell. Good, bad, whatever. Yeah, good. Whatever. Yeah, good. Okay. The weights. This, this what we want to learn is just the marginal impact of x on y. Right. I'm not saying it's causal, but it's predictive. So if I know this, this is going to tell me how much I'm going to change the prediction of y. With respect to this. <laughs> you think of that as just, the, it's really the partial derivative, actually. Right? So, a quick example. This is Yellowstone. Awesome. If you go to the United States, well, if, if you're currently like not going to the US, that's cool. I get it. <laughs> but in, hopefully, in, in a couple of years, when you feel comfortable again, um, and we're letting people in, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I thought I knew the kind of, I don't know. Anyway, so this is, but this is beautiful. So this is, this has nothing to do with politics, nature, although actually that is political now. Anyway, so this is Yellowstone, and the way this works, this is Old, old Faithful. Who, who, who's been here? Nobody? All right, one person. Okay, so in two years come, this is amazing, this is like amazing, now, this is actually a huge volcano. There's a, a mega volcano here, underneath this. So this is all um, on top of a volcano. So this thing goes off, um, You'll have, a, you'll have an eruption, 
And it's called Old Faithful because it, it goes on sort of two types of durations. So here, here we have time, right, since the last, right? So eruption time, like how long does the eruption last? So the longer it lasts for, the time between each eruption changes. So there's a relationship potentially between the time between, right, the duration between each eruption and how long one lasts, right? So maybe we could sort of think of there's a little like linear relationship. So the input down here, output. And I, I want my want to predict. So if I can see this eruption, I see how long it's lasted. Now I might want to make a prediction about when the next one's going to be, right? Okay. In this very simple model because I only have duration, right? I have the intercept term, and then I have the, the partial, the slope. The slope. Yep. That's it. And it happens to be in this case with this data, we have this relationship. So here I put my model, and so here, here's the intercept term. So this, these numbers just define this line, this partition. So the goal is, to, and how do you go about learning the weights? There's a couple of ways. One is analytically, right? So these are just with a little matrix algebra. This is the pseudo inverse. Morris Penrose left inverse, right? I'm looking at the statistician guy, you said you're a stats guy. So anyway, so this is this is this is the way you would solve it analytically. This though, um, if you have a lot of data, you don't want to do it this way probably because this is the complex. Remember we're talking about computer science and we're talking about algorithmic complexity. This thing you have to do in a matrix inversion, and that's the order of it's a quadratic. So this takes more and more data. It's it's the square root of the time of the data. So this this becomes quite big, also in memory. And this is what's known as least squares or in this case, it's maximum likelihood estimation as well. It's the same when certain, certain assumptions hold. Clear? You don't need to know this, but this might be good to know if you want to get into this. And this is all the simple stuff. This is simple model. Um, or usually, what's, like this is what we do in our software, or if you're actually going to use any neural nets or any, anything that's at scale or run real time, you're going to use something called stochastic gradient descent. We, we can go into this. I kind of cut that because we don't have a ton of time. Um, but this is usually sublinear, right? So this, this actually is very quick. All this is saying is that instead of like doing all the updates at once, you basically take the current prediction, right? So I just make a random guess. I make a prediction, I see how well I did, right? This is my error, how far off I am by some weight. And then I update the new one by how far off. So just think of like, you're just like gauging. Yes, what? Douglas. Sounds like you're getting into reinforcement though. Well, no, I, no. <laughs> reinforcement learning, you can actually think of is like the higher class. I mean, we can talk about reinforcement learning as well. It's like almost like the meta class of all of learning because you can subsume a lot of it under reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a control problem, ultimately. It's prediction control. This is just, I'm just doing prediction, and this is actually an optimization algorithm. This is a way of learning the weights. And I could learn, if I had a reinforcement learning problem, I could learn it this way. But there's also methods where I could learn it this way. This is, I'm just looking at one data. All it is is, if let's say you have a set of data and you want to take the mean. I could average, I could sum up all the data and divide by n. I could do that. Or I could say, the first data point I take, and then I take the second point, and then I just weight it by minus the first one, by the second one. There's a, you can do an uh, incremental approach. So mm -hmm. I could also calculate the mean using something like this. The main point of this is just at scale, I mean, people talking about big data, or um, if you're doing like deep learning, they, they all use stochastic rate. Usually they use something like this, because they might do a mini-batch type of thing, but it's just you, you wouldn't do the normal thing that you would look at in a normal textbook. Like what you learn in, in grad school, undergraduate, and, and econometrics or, or your stats class, you do something like this in, in practice. I just want to let folks know, because I know there's different, different skills set here. Um, there are nice properties to the simple model. <coughs> I said you could use, uh, you could do it fast online. The weights are interpretable in a way, <coughs> just the marginals, and so it, they're sort of interpretable. Uh, you talk to a marketer and you give them a matrix of weights, it's a disaster. And we spent about two years trying to like remap this into like a decision tree, um, just because this is this actually isn't really interpretable, um, and that's fine for for CMOs. There's no reason why or marketers need it. There's certain nice properties. The statistician, afterwards, you can talk to him. What's your name? Luca. Luca. Talk to Luca about uh, blue, or even blue, maybe, depending upon the uh, assumptions. UMV we. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's Pearson Nyman or 
uh, rail, prey rail, bound, whatever. Yeah, but that'll depend upon the, the assumptions of the model. But the main thing is it's robust. And actually, this is the one thing that we could have maybe disagreed about or talked about. When you're running certain hypothesis tests as well, or any type of test, or any type of analysis, r robustness is, is what you're, you might want to care about this. So even if it's not like the correct, right? You, you know, someone could be like really, you know, fussy or priggish about the thing, and they're like, oh, this thing, Luke might come in, oh, you have heteroscedasticity or something, so it's wrong. But actually, it's often quite robust. And so even if, it, it, it's, it's not, you're gonna have very close to the, a very good answer, even if certain assumptions don't hold. And that's true actually with certain hypothesis tests. So uh, if you have enough, a certain amount of data, then actually, whether you're using parametric, non-parametric, it usually doesn't matter. You're, you're gonna come to the same conclusion regardless. That's actually true also between using certain Bayesian approaches and frequentist approach. If you're doing a hypothesis test, that's a very simple analysis. You just have four numbers, right? They convert, they didn't convert, how many times you gave A, how many times you gave B. It's four numbers. So if you were to get different results between the two, you probably have a problem. There's, <coughs> there's an issue there because they should, they, should, they should give you the same answer. Assuming uninformative prior, right? So whispering, questions, or just <laughs> critiquing? Yeah, okay. Uh, but the bad, this is what you're gonna get at. You're gonna get this weight structure of, you know, here's like product A, product B, we're trying to predict the conversion rate of like these K products, right? And now you're gonna have all of the marginal weights with respect to the features. That may be not so interpretable, right? So let's say it looks like something like this. So maybe I'm on to show three, I have three ads that I wanna show, and I wanna show the ad that has the highest value, the highest conversion rate, Condition that I know information about the users. I'm going to condition, um, and just look at this. Okay, which one is the best for Apple users? Apple people coming from a rural area, and now you got to like, you know, it's it's difficult to know. Um, so you could also use a decision tree. Um, decision tree basically just does hard partitions of the data. I'm not going to go into the algorithms, but there's you can talk to me afterwards. There's Cart, there's C4.5, there's other types of algorithms that usually use some measure of, of mutual information or entropy to like kind of make these splits. But what's really nice about a tree is that you get these leaf nodes and you can just read along the tree. So you could say, well, what's, you know, if, if I'm on a, an Apple device, then I can, you know, figure out what the predicted value is, right? So I could walk the tree and then I could say, okay, visitors who are new, but they're not on an Apple device and they're not rural, then I can get the predicted value, predicted conversion rate of each one of the, the options, and I can make selections based upon that, right? And you can do stuff like, we do stuff like we actually calculate the posterior distribution as well around each, which is similar to, it's a different way of looking at confidence interval, it's, it's really we're estimating sort of the probability of, of each predicted value, right, over this distribution, right? But it's related to knowing uncertainty measure, in a way, of each one of the options, and this is related to multi arm bandits as well. So if you're doing Thompson sampling, you would take selections from here, and you would just pick whichever one's best. And because there's overlap, B might get selected more often than C, might, might occasionally get selected over C. Anyway, that encodes that. We can, we can talk about that a little detail. I don't want to get too, off, too far off track. So what's really good about trees, I highly recommend then if you have to work with other parts of the organization, because then they can feel like they're part of the process because you give them a you give them a regression model or you give them a deep, or whatever you give them a more complex model that it freaks them out it's like I don't understand this but if you give them something like a tree then they can feel like they're part of it and then also they can give you feedback what thank you to that uh, uh, <laughs> yeah it, it's like think about it you want to bring everyone in and then if they can interpret the thing they might look they might say look Gershoff what the hell are you talking about. There's no way we would ever get 12% of our users don't look like this. You got a problem. How would I know that? Or you might know that. You might not know that. You guys are doing the analysis, but you may not be the domain expert. So if you do something like a tree, you get you you get the count. You can see in that cell how many users are in there, how much data has come in, and they might say that can't be right. They're not they're not they're not dummies. They have they have domain well I don't know, but they they have, <laughs> they have domain knowledge, and so they can help you. I once, I, want, I, I used to work in database marketing back in the 90s, and so we actually did this, this stuff isn't actually new at all. And so I, want, I went, uh, we used to build um, logistic regression models. 
Uh, and that's the worst, because that actually, instead of just being like a simple interpretation of the weights, it's like log odds, and that's totally confusing. I get confused, they, there's no way they're gonna understand it. And then I, I was like, oh, I'm being a dummy. So I just did a tree. And this is actually a key point. The, the logistic regression model is slightly more accurate than doing the decision tree. But on the, on, the, on the test data that we had, and the training data, it was more accurate. But in market, you always want to test this thing in market. I don't care. I don't. You show me a model. I don't care. How well is it going to? When I plug it into the program and actually take action on it, what's the marginal lift of using this model versus nothing, or using this model versus the other model? And you should always do that. So, all this model building stuff pipes into what he was talking about. What I was talking about for doing experiment. This is just another arm in an experiment, right? So you want to test this. So this is a way of moving also away from ding dong, changing button color and nonsense or whatever because that's the only thing that you have control over. It's, you use all those skills about A-B testing, hypothesis testing, and you feed all this stuff in. You want to be testing this stuff as well. Is the decision tree good because it doesn't necessarily overfit the data, do you think? It can overfit the data. Okay. Yeah, so you, there's, there's methods of, of, of um, pruning the tree and, <coughs> and whatnot, but yeah, to, all of it can overfit the data, but de definitely. But yeah, so overfitting is definitely an issue. And that's what I was talking about before. When the error, he was talking about when um, Luca was talking about error structure, the overfitting is when we start modeling the error, just random components. And so, in a way, our model is has, has too much capacity, right? It's almost like um, think uh, coffee and and pot, pot, coffee and dope, right? So th that's that's that, that's actually good. So, <laughs> so here's here's right. So here, right? I don't know. That's like that's 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 the joint. And here, not saying that you should, but unless you're in Colorado, uh, you, where it's legal. And here's the coffee. And here's here's the, here's here's the line. And this is kind of like the overfitting line. And this is bias. And this is uh, variance. This is the mean. This is the bias variance trade-off. And here is overfit. Often, I'm an amazing writer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so what do you like being on coffee? Or I guess there's a, a stronger drug. Um, what's the cocaine or something? Something where you're super animated in any input, you res you have a big output. So I do something little. <laughs> crystal meth. Yeah. So this is like meth. Meth head over here, right? I he knows. <laughs> this is an overfitted. This is deep learning. Okay, you're doing your you, you, your boss. It, it, they're, they're obsessed. They want. They just want to signal that they're sophisticated. So they're like, oh, we got to use deep deep learning on your crappy web page, and you're just testing button color, and it doesn't matter. It's all noise, really. So th there's this thing, and so this is could have millions of those weights, massively nonlinear. This so any small change in input. Big change in output, small change in it. This is meth or coffee, you're totally wired. Good chance of overfitting. Dude, man, right? So <laughs> you know, right? Cool. This big inputs, still almost no output. Like this is like, you're just using the mean. So let's say your predicted model is just, just use the average. Don't condition on any of the other information, whatever, it doesn't matter. You be insensitive to all the other information. That's, that's highly biased. That, but that, that could be more robust, depends. And in the marketing situation, if you're using facial recognition, you know there's a lot of structure, or you're doing games, you already know that there's a solution to find, there's an optimal controller, you already know it's a high structured problem that's almost deterministic, you just need to learn it, then this is gonna be crappy, you don't wanna do this. You, you probably want something high capacity or can, can, can find the structure. Marketing, you guys don't even know. You're running A/B tests, and half the time, nothing matters. Why you get? Why do you think doing a complex model is going to help? It isn't. You have got nothing there. You have terrible ideas. <laughs> you 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 get to go over here when you get good ideas. <laughs> Bad ideas stay over here. And don't do any harm. Okay? I'm serious. Our software does this, right? I'm a terrible sales guy. But our software does this, and what's built in is it believes that it's in a null world. It believes. What he was talking about, like the null, we, 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 the prior belief, the empirical prior is that A, B, and C, D, whatever, they're all the same. So we, we, the prior we use is the grand mean. We squish everything back and we say everything is the same. Everything is the same for all users and everything is the same over A, B, and C. And now the data has to start proving to us that actually A, B, and C are different 
and potentially different for different users. But just adding complexity to like a problem that's all noise, it, it doesn't matter. You're just gonna you're just gonna overfit. Uh, so it's good. Hard partitions you can just encode it as SQL or whatever. Uh, they overfit. Who, who said overfit? Someone said overfit about the trees. Bing, 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 bing. So that is an, uh, not a good. Uh, and they might not be expressive enough. It could be too simple. So like if you're doing like image recognition or something like that, that'd be crap. It'd be really bad. Uh, unsupervised. Um, and whenever the time is, anyone can bail. If I know I have a monotone voice, and it's like <laughs> oh god, the kind of New Yorkery, obnoxious guy. So. If, is it time now? And then I'm gonna stay, and I'll quickly go over unsupervised, if people are interested. Um, but I don't know when the, when the time break is. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, yeah. So whatever anyone wants to do, I will be a little bit <laughs> insulted, but that's fine. So, should I keep going? Yeah. Okay, um, unsupervised learning, uh, or how to cluster, or, where are I right here? <laughs> discover oh discover the hidden labels, right? So a little different problem. Before we knew what the output was, it was supervised. So supervised, think of like you're back in school, and you take you take it the exam, and then there's the grade book, and then the the instructor goes through the grade book and sees how well you.